Intimate Judaism deals with sensitive topics and uses explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. In this particular broadcast, we will be discussing sexual harassment and sexual abuse. This is a topic that may be emotionally triggering for many of you listeners, so please be aware of this and consider this before choosing to listen to our podcast today. Welcome to Intimate Judaism. I'm Rabbi Scott Kahn. And I'm Tali Rosenbaum. Today's episode is going to be dealing with a topic which has been discussed a lot over the past few weeks. Today we're going to be talking about the question of whether adherence to halacha, Jewish law, protects people, protects women and children from things like sexual assault and sexual violence in general. And this is a result of an article that was written and published in Tablet Magazine, which I'll let you talk about. I do want to say that we're doing this episode, it's kind of with a heavy heart. I mean, I think we're dealing with some really complex issues. I am, however, really excited to introduce later in the show our special guest, Dr. Rachel Yehuda, who is also my sister. Um, She is a professor of psychiatry and neuroscience and the director of traumatic stress studies at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. In addition to being an expert in the field of trauma, she does teach pastoral counseling and is co-editor with Dr. Michelle Friedman of a book called The Jewish Art of Pastoral Counseling. So I think she'll have a lot to say to weigh in on the subject. So as you said, Tali, the spur for this episode in particular was the article written by Rabbi Avi Shafrin from the Agudat Yisrael of America. The article was in Tablet Magazine and published on October 17, 2018. It's entitled, A Safer Space for Women in Orthodox Judaism's Rules for Sex. And that title really explains what it's about, which it fundamentally is saying and suggesting that the rules that Halacha makes about Yichud being in private with a woman and man together who are not married, or for example, the laws of Shomer Negia, modesty, etc., the various rules the halacha sets up as guardrails protecting people from sexual misconduct are essentially what Western society really could use nowadays. And if more people would be careful to keep these rules, much of what goes on in the Me Too movement would be avoided in the first place simply because men would not be subject to doing things that they shouldn't do in terms of sexual assault. I hope I'm phrasing it and describing it fairly. I'll just read a couple of lines that he said in his article so people get the idea of what I'm speaking about. He writes, Halacha observant Jews are enjoined to dress in ways that respect and do not flaunt our bodies. We may not so much as touch members of the other sex in a friendly manner and are precluded by Jewish law from being secluded in a room together with a member of the other sex. Even entertaining sexual thoughts about others to whom one is not married is forbidden. I'm jumping ahead. Yes, sexual abuse happens in the Orthodox world as well, but it is relatively rare, and all it takes to understand why is to read the accounts of abused women in the larger realm. Many begin innocently enough with an invitation to a meal, then to discuss some business venture in a hotel room, followed perhaps with a friendly physical contact. In a world where no man and woman who aren't married to each other may be in an isolated place and where no touch, short of things like preventing a fall or treating an injury, is permitted, those guardrails keep many a masculine muscle car from speeding, much less careening off the road. And therefore, Tali... A masculine muscle car. Masculine muscle car. So Rabbi Shafrin, through all good intentions, is essentially suggesting that Sexual abuse happens less often in the Orthodox community, or at least in segments of the Orthodox community, which are careful about these laws. And he also says very explicitly that these rules themselves are the reason why, or at least a big component of the reason why. And that caused a lot of controversy. And, yes. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I'll just continue the story. Two major articles came out to dispute Rabbi Shafrin's claims. Both of the articles that came out as a response to Rabbi Shafrin did say that's not true, that sexual abuse in Orthodox communities are rare. And it's also not true that covering up and keeping the laws of yichud, which means not to be alone together in a room with a male or a male with a female, it's not true that they prevent women Um, from being sexually abused. Both of these articles referenced our paper, The History of Past Sexual Abuse in Married Observant Jewish Women. This was one of the articles that came out from our larger study on sexual satisfaction. Rachel Yehuda, who we're going to be talking to later on the show, was the primary investigator 
And I also worked on this study. This article was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 2007. And what we concluded from our sample was that sexual abuse, in fact, does occur in the ultra-Orthodox community at the same rates as it does in the general population. The study, by the way, will be available on our show notes on intimatejudaism.com. As a result of those two articles, Rabbi Shaffron then wrote again, and he It was said, in cross-currents, I believe. It was in cross-currents, and he basically said, look, I wasn't talking about child sex abuse. I was talking about adults and the way that they behave and the way that women contribute to what happens to them through their unrespectful, undignified behavior. And in response to what was written about our study, he kind of questioned the statistics because he said, well, look, there were Bale Chuva, returnees to Judaism, in the sample. And so we don't really know that they were all abused in the context of living an Orthodox life. Some of them may have been abused before or by somebody who's not Jewish. I have to say that as I approach talking about this, and I think it's helped that I have processed some of this over the week, again, I'm reminding you, I'm a clinician, I'm a couples therapist, it's my job to stay calm and to stay curious. And also when working with couples, I'm also really aware that there is always a dynamic and that in any kind of sexual interaction, there absolutely is a complexity and a dance. And, you know, if a man says something to one woman, it might be flattering. And if he says the same exact thing to another woman, it might be violating. And so I think that I can understand where the thinking comes from. There You're speaking is the thinking that Rabbi Shaffron's the representing. Thing, yeah, I think that I can understand it. It also represents a very black and white way of thinking. It's not nuanced. It's as though, well, this must work and anything else would not work. We are white. We separate the genders. We don't allow any sort of interaction. We don't even leave people in the same room together. Now, what I have to say is that, to me, isn't about safety. It's about boundaries. But not only is that about boundaries, it's about artificial boundaries. What we want to do, and we've spoken about this before on our previous podcasts, is that we don't want to make everything about what's allowed and what's not allowed. The problem with doing that is that what happens is, is that in some Haredi communities, sexual abuse is considered just another tznut, modesty violation, because really the overall prohibition is not really even considered all that great. And that's one of the things I'm going to be throwing back at you. I also want to say that exerting sexual power on another human being, it's not about sex drive necessarily. It's about coercion and it's violating to other people. And the way to avoid that in our communities is to talk to our children about autonomy and about consent and about respect and not by just separating and saying, well, if you can't get to her, then you won't be able to touch her. What happens when you can get to her? Look, I think we can acknowledge Rabbi Shaffron's point that our culture is very different than a Hollywood culture and that a certain type of harassment can take place in the backdrop of immodesty and hooking up and alcohol, etc. But to come along and say, but by us, it doesn't happen. Really, that's not the issue. The issue is what is the mechanism of harassment and of abuse in our community? The questions that we need to ask are, how do these things happen despite our boundaries and our restrictions? And not sit back smugly in the belief that this isn't happening because we know that it is. So again, I don't want to rant. I want to stay calm. As you can see, I You're feel- You're doing a good job. Thank you. As you can see, I feel very strongly about these issues. But what saddens me the most is the defensiveness, the rabbinic. Rabbi Shaffron, with all due respect, he is a rabbi, and he is representing rabbis when he speaks, and he's representing Orthodox Judaism to some extent. And it saddens me that when you have a scientific article, you will quibble about statistics rather than say, wow, what are we going to do about this? Sex abuse exists. Disrespect of women and of children's autonomy over their bodies, it exists. This is what we need to be working on. So 
first, I do have questions for you. I do have questions for Dr. Yehuda to Rachel. But I first want to ask you, Scott, you're a rabbi. What do you say about this? How do we make rabbis part of the solution and not, unfortunately, part of the problem? Well, let me preface it by saying I certainly hope I am not the voice of Judaism with a capital J. I am a voice among the many vocal voice of Judaism. I hope and believe that everyone should have an approach to Judaism, which belongs uniquely to that individual, that person. So I try to represent Judaism in these podcasts as much as I can. It must remain a fragmentary approach because it's my view of the diamond that's Judaism. I see my facet the same way you'll see your facet, and every individual has to see his facet. So I will present it as best I can. That's the first point. Second of all, I want to say anything I say should not be understood as Chas Shalom trashing Rabbi Shafrin, for whom I have great respect. I happen to disagree with him in this article, but I don't want it to be understood as anything other than an honest disagreement about what he says, which this I don't agree with. This isn't really just about Rabbi Shafrin. I don't want to make this podcast today about Rabbi Shafrin. There has been a lot of feedback and a lot of back and forth. And if you follow what's going on, you will know that his view is pretty well represented by many, many people. And it's actually a pretty not uncommon way of looking at things. And in a way, I feel that the article sabotaged all the good work that has been done until now to actually get the world, especially the Orthodox world, to see what's actually happening and to begin to not only be aware and prevent, but also prevent cover up because that's also been a big problem in our communities. I certainly agree with that. So in terms of what you said to me about how do we make rabbis more accountable, and I absolutely agree that rabbis or any Jewish leader or any Jew who has a position or a voice has to be held accountable for the way the Judaism is presented. And unfortunately, I agree with you completely that people are far too defensive. And our job isn't to be defensive. Our job is to seek truth on the one hand and to provide comfort to people who need on the other. And those two are actually counteracted by being overly defensive. Our job isn't to defend the tradition with a capital T. Our job is to make it work for everybody while remaining completely, absolutely dedicated to halacha. And they shouldn't be at loggerheads. I just want to quickly quote Rav Soloveitchik in an essay called Majesty and Humility. He wasn't talking about this, but I think he actually was talking about the way that we should inculcate in rabbis' understanding of their job. And Rav Soloveitchik says as follows. Man is required from time to time to defy the world, to replace the old and obsolete with the new and relevant. Only lonely man is capable of casting off the harness of bondage to society. Who was Abraham? Who was Elijah? Who were the prophets? People who dared rebuke society in order to destroy the status quo and replace it with a new social order. He says this in the context of describing heroism as a key halakha category. So no one is suggesting and I don't want this to be misunderstood, that we should destroy the halachic system, chas v'shalom, that's not what he means. It's certainly not how I'm trying to take him to mean. However, we have to look at things that are not working, especially when they're coming from within a Torah community, and in my mind, are violating halacha, which is what defensiveness does. And we have to stand up there, like the prophets of old, and rebuke them and say, this is not acceptable. So what would you say? What's not acceptable? Well, first of all, I'd say this. Saying that our halachot are the thing that is needed in order to guard against sexual assault, I think, number one, it's a faulty reading of the sources. And second of all, it's proven practically not to be true. How does that work with halacha? Because halacha clearly does say, we can't deny it, that these things are guardrails. We can't pretend that these are just chukim. We don't know the reason why. It's quite clear that the reason why we have laws like Yichud, which appears at the very end of Masach Kiddushin, and other laws like that, is in order to provide a protection, a fence against violating certain things. However, number one, I don't think it's a protection against violence, protection against a power dynamic. To me, it makes much more sense, and the more I thought about this, the more clear it became to me. It's talking about, for example, two consenting adults who are each married, let's say, for example, to somebody else, not being in Yichud together. It's talking about a type of situation where things might slide into a certain case, a slippery slope of a certain sort, which you might not want either. But it's not talking about assault. Someone who is interested, quote unquote, in assault, someone who would have that idea of committing violence or trying to do something underhanded where only one partner is interested, I don't think they'd be listening or caring about the laws of Yichud. They might even use the halachot to their advantage in certain ways that we can discuss at different time. Ultimately, these laws are not talking about violence or assault. That's number one. The second point is this, which is that the Ramban, Nachmanides, and probably his most famous comment on all of Chumash is Ramban at the very beginning of Parsha Kedoshim, Vayikra Perak Yutet. 
he talks about the phrase kedoshim to you, be holy. And in his opinion, what does this mean? It means a person is not allowed to be a naval birshut Torah. He cannot be a disgusting person who is still not violating halacha. What the Ramban means is the object of law of discussion, but the simple understanding of the Ramban, I believe, is saying fundamentally there is an ethic independent of halacha. It means that there are certain things which halacha does not address, and yet we know that they are disgusting, evil, and wrong. A person is not allowed to be a naval b'rishut Torah, and that pasuk, according to the Ramban, is preventing us and prohibiting us from acting in ways that are wrong, even though halacha does not technically enjoin them. And it, with that, I'll say that Rabbi Walter Wurzberger, who was a big Talmud of Rav Salvechik and the editor of Tradition Magazine for about 26 years, he wrote in a very famous essay that halacha is a floor, not a ceiling. And we have to realize that. Halacha gives us the basic ideas from which we start. It's not the end of morality. It's the beginning of morality. We can go beyond what halacha requires of us. So when halacha doesn't necessarily prevent sexual assault in strong terms, as you said before, Tali, that might be true, but it's an ignoring of that Ramban. It's ignoring of this idea that Rabbi Wurzberger is saying, and which appears in many other places also. Because even though the prohibition in the Torah might be technically on a lower level than eating chametz on Pesach, it doesn't change the fact that it is fundamentally a disgusting thing to do. And anyone who doesn't realize that and who thinks that all the halacha demands is all we need, that person is ignoring that Ramban and this whole aspect of halacha. So let me just make one final point. I know you want to get in here. But a couple podcasts ago, in our podcast about Sherman Nagia, I talked about the fact that people who understand halacha very, very deeply will often say that technically it might seem like one thing is more serious than another, but if you don't have a really broad and deep understanding of halacha, you can't say that. And my example was Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky saying, on a pure halachic level, intermarriage is far preferable to a couple sleeping together while the wife is in a state of nida. On the other hand, he says that's ridiculous. And it takes a deep knowledge to understand that. So often I think the answer would be that rabbis have to have a deeper understanding and realize when they don't. I'm glad that you gave this example. And before we go to our guest, I just want to comment on what you said. First of all, I really enjoyed what you said, especially about uh, Naval B'Rishud HaTorah. I think it's important that we acknowledge that even sometimes in marriage, a woman can feel objectified and she may feel compelled to act sexually in ways that she may not want to do because of an understanding that this is what she has to do halachically. For example, and I've heard this, there is a Gemara that talks about pat bisello, the need for the man to know that his bread is in his basket. And that gives them the idea that if you get your husband started, you have to finish. And this goes along with that same line of thinking, that what were you thinking getting on stage and dancing in front of men, what do you expect? And that brings us back to Rabbi Sheffrin's original issue with the Me Too movement. And I definitely agree with you that we can't go into victim blaming and all that would be very, very inappropriate and wrong and incorrect. At the same time, as I said, the fact that people believe certain things and the fact that people can quote a certain Gemara in a certain context, and obviously you're saying that people do quote this Gemara about having bread in your basket, that's perfectly fine. Halacha, Gemara, Midrashim, all the halachic sources of the Rishonim, the Achronim, and everything else is a huge, a huge literature, perhaps I should say multiple huge literatures. Now, the particular example of Pat Bisalo, you're saying that people use it to describe a certain type of situation. Truthfully, it is a bit out of context, really. It's referring more to a husband's ability to control himself, knowing he has a wife at home who is pure. So it's not quite talking about interrupted intercourse. But that's almost beside the point, because let's assume for the moment that even though this particular case is taken out of context, there are other lines that are not taken out of context. Certain lines of the Gemara that can be used to describe certain type of objectification of women. However, taking any one line out and putting that up and saying this is the key line, as opposed to saying it's part of a larger discussion among rabbis over the past 2,000 years about what halacha's place is or what any given actions is in that sea of halacha, I can't accept that someone would take that one line and say that is the essence of what sexual intercourse and marriage is all okay. about, meaning people might do it, and I accept, but that would simply be okay. wrong. At the end we have of to the tell day, them that's not the way to do Scott, it. Scott, at the end of the day, what we're talking about is feeling safe. Okay, how do we promote safety and autonomy over our bodies, over our children's bodies? And also, how do we protect men from being put 
in the position of being aggressors or being told that they can't help themselves. So at this point, I would very much like to invite Dr. Rachel Yehuda to weigh in on what's been said so far to talk about the study that we did and to kind of make meaning out of the sexual abuse situation in the Orthodox community and how you, Rachel, would approach this issue with the rabbis who you teach. I'm also particularly curious in hearing from you about what constitutes the feeling of safety and security. Okay, thank you for having me on this podcast. I've really enjoyed listening to it, and I'm glad that we're talking about sexual abuse in the Jewish community. And we wrote a paper about this many years ago that basically said something that I thought was quite conservative. It just basically said that There is sexual abuse in the Jewish community, both in the modern Orthodox community and in the Haredi community. And there is also um, childhood sexual abuse. We did not claim that there were greater rates of abuse, but rather in the sample that we studied, which is a very narrow sample of the Jewish population, and that is married women who reported regular use of the mikvah, the prevalence of sexual abuse was comparable in this sample to what has been reported in other samples. So the claim that sexual abuse happens less frequently isn't really supported by our study, and it doesn't seem supported based on the reactions to Rabbi Sheffrin's article. It doesn't seem to be supported by uh, the public perception or individual cases. And so that should be that. And and any attempt to try to claim that this is not a problem in the community strike me as really strange. Why would anyone want to claim that this isn't a problem when it is? You can't solve a problem that you don't acknowledge. What are your thoughts about modest dress as actually guarding a woman from a sexually violent attack by a man. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a big fan of that uh, line of reasoning. I think it really is a blame the victim kind of reasoning. It gives women a very false sense that sexual violence is about how they behave and not how the perpetrator behaves. It sends a message that men need, cannot self-regulate, as you so correctly point out, but that really it's up to women and everyone else to create a world that will prevent them <laughs> from getting out of control. And I just don't think that it's true. I think that it can also have the opposite effect of creating increased sensitivity. If the kind of dress where everything exposed um I don't think that it enhances sexual violence. I think that that kind of dress actually decreases sensitivity to nudity, to to body parts, to things like that. And so extreme covering up may actually have the effect of hypersexualizing people. But at the end of the day, as you so correctly said, Tali, sexual abuse isn't about sex. It's about violence, it's about power, and it's about putting people in their place. It's not about not being able to control one's sexual desires. The question that we really have to ask is, do women, do females in the Jewish society have the appropriate setup for feeling power? Your word autonomy is really good. And the answer to that is, Are they equal members of the society? Do they have the same rights? Are they counted in the same way? Do we want to hear their voice? Do we think that their minds are as able (laughs) as that of men? And I think that there are a lot of problems. I, I take Rabbi Scott's point of not wanting to quote things out of context, but there are so many messages that a very young boy or girl can get from, you know, reading the Talmudic sources and the kind of impressions that you could get are that females are inferior. Yeah, They shouldn't be seen. They shouldn't be heard. I do want to add, though, you know, as a clinician in the Orthodox community, I have worked with a lot of men 
who, as young men in yeshiva settings, have also been molested by older Bahrim, by older men in the community. I completely agree with your thesis about gender roles and power, but I also think it's more than just a gender issue. There is a power issue which speaks to objectification in general. I guess so. I think that the the Me Too movement isn't just about what happened to women. It could be what happened to anybody for sure. But I think that nobody's telling a man that he can prevent abuse by the way he dresses. That's a message that's being given to women. And if separating genders is the way to promote safety, then you're absolutely right. How are you going to promote uh, sexual violence within a gender? They're not being protected because we know that there, right. are, there, there are a lot of cases. And in families where there are no issues of Yehud or there are less issues of Yehud, there's incest. We can't rely on the false belief that these laws are protective. Can I just add one point to Please. this, which is largely in the context of what I said earlier. In Halacha, and Rav Salvechik as well makes a very big point about this idea, there's a difference between what's called the Ma'aseh HaMitzvah and the Kiyum HaMitzvah, the physical action which represents the thing that you do in the context of Halacha, and the inner change is supposed to affect in the personality of the person. A great example of this is Rav Salvechik's understanding of the law of tshuva, of repentance, where the Rambam says, the law is you have to confess. So Rav Salvechik explains, the Maaseh mitzvah is the act of confessing, whereas the Kiyuma mitzvah is the act of returning to God. And many mitzvot have this action. Tefillah is the same thing. The Maaseh are the words you say. The Kiyum is the inner life that you're developing, the Avodah Shabalev, the worship of the heart. In the same way, I think people often will make a mistake in the halachic world, going back to that question of what can we do, substituting the Ma'aseh mitzvah for the Kiyum mitzvah. That doesn't mean to get rid of the Ma'aseh mitzvah, but it means sometimes we forget that the Ma'aseh mitzvah is a vehicle rather than the ends in itself. And too often, speaking of objectification of anybody or of anything, that's an example of Ma'aseh mitzvah lacking the Kiyum mitzvah. I think in Sinayut very often, the Ma'aseh mitzvah, for example, is emphasized at the expense of the Kiyum mitzvah or perhaps with a wrong idea of Kiyum mitzvah. This is only in order to prevent men from doing something bad to you girls or women, and the Kiyum HaMitzvah might be something far different from that. I just think it's an important point to emphasize. When we look at these various ideas, one of the reasons for our defensiveness, I'll speak about us as the rabbinic community, may very well come from a confusing of these different ideas, of realizing that if the Maaseh HaMitzvah isn't doing its job, if it's not protecting people as it's supposed to, ostensibly, perhaps the problem isn't in the Maaseh HaMitzvah. Perhaps the problem is that we're not educating people properly in the internal dynamics of what you're supposed to develop. Yeah, you know... I understand what you're saying, but I think to be a rabbi now in the modern world must be very, very challenging because to live in the modern world, you want to be egalitarian. But if you're a rabbi, you can't count a woman to your minion. How do you cope with that discrepancy? How do you, on the one hand, try to support the tradition that doesn't really seem that egalitarian? while maybe having a more modern sensibility that tells you inside that maybe it's time for women to be counted yeah, as well. Yeah, I, think, I, I, think that it, I think it's a very tough struggle. And in pastoral counseling education, these issues come up where um, it's not, you know, <laughs> rabbis really struggle. Yeah, I don't mean that. to cut you off. I, I think that that's an important point. But what I look at I know that little me, I'm not going to really have all that much influence on the halachic structure of, and the social structure in that big of a way. What, what's more important is the idea that if we educate our children, our boys and our girls, what is preventative to abuse when a little boy or a little girl is abused? And I think this is something that you're honestly an expert about because you really understand what happens and what the neurophysiology is. But when rabbis talk about a person's volition, a person's role in perpetuating the problem or causing the problem, it's a lack of understanding of what happens to people when they develop without the part of their sense of self that allows them to believe that it's not okay to do this to me, that this is my body and that 
I can say no. And when we're brought up that you can't say no, that you can't say no to older people because they know what's best for you. And we don't have a voice that says, if somebody's touching you and you don't like it, you can say no. And again, I think this has more to do with objectification of humans. I totally respect the gender issue here. That definitely is a problem and it's a problem in our sources. But in terms of what can we do, I don't know how much Counting Women for a Minion is going to help as much as empowering our children to know that they have choices. Now, we know that when you are in a situation of trauma, you can't always say stop. And saying stop might even affect your ability to survive. So you freeze. And as therapists, we teach this to our clients so that they don't feel so much shame and guilt about what occurred. I'm very concerned that these messages undermine our therapeutic process by perpetuating the idea that you are responsible for your abuse. And I wanted you to comment on that. Well, Tali, yes. I mean, most sexual abuse victims are absolutely haunted by what they may have done to bring about the abuse. And that's because the perpetrator often says things like, oh, you're so irresistible. You're driving me crazy. I can't resist this. And then they give them other messages about how powerful they are, because if they tell anybody, they will detonate their whole entire world. So it is very very difficult to be a victim of abuse because on the one hand, you're being given this false message that you're so powerful that you can get the perpetrator to behave in crazy ways and you're so powerful you can create an absolute explosion in your personal life and in the lives of anyone that you might tell. And on the other hand, if you're that powerful, why can't you prevent the abuse? So I think that you're absolutely right that these messages undermine things that are done in a therapeutic context. In a therapeutic context, we have to spend a lot of time letting abuse victims know that it's the perpetrator that is to blame here, not the victim. But that doesn't stop people from wondering if maybe they should have dressed more modestly. And I just, I think that that really is a very confusing message. Yeah, it is. But I don't, really agree with you that not giving women an equal status is irrelevant to the problem. I think it's very easy to objectify people that you think are lesser. And I think that it is very, very important for um, a truly safe society that we respect every single person and that certain kinds of people don't get more respect than others. You don't count one person as three-fifths of another. Everybody is important. Every soul, every person has to be equal. I'm not saying whether you count them in a minion per se or not, but I think that there are a lot of um, opportunities to provide a corrective message. Absolutely. And I think an important point that comes out, at least for me listening in, I realize that you have done so much research and I really... I'm very, very new to all of this information, but a lot of it that I'm getting out of it, and I'd like to know if you agree with this, is simply the fact that we as teachers, as rabbis, as any sort of Jewish clergy, have to keep in mind and stop saying that the ideas that we call protective have anything at all to do with abuse and stop pretending that that is related in some sort of way. A lot and stop of, telling our daughters that their skirts are too short, that they're going to invite trouble. That's the same thing, meaning if it's a result of what they do, then that's part of the same problem. For example, Rabbi Abraham Tversky, as well as uh, Rabbi Willig, Rabbi Mordechai Willig from YU, have done a lot of talking about spousal abuse, about men abusing their wives. And if you look at sources, even the Rambam, certainly, not to get into this now, it's not presented as an inherently bad thing. And yet at the same time, they have been going very, very strongly about that doesn't matter, and they've written books about how serious this is. And we have to Remember that, okay, we know what the sources say, and that's one thing. The halacha lamase goes in a different direction. In much the same way, we have to try and take sexual abuse and modesty and detach them. Because as long as they remain attached, we're going to have victim blaming. And it also, from what you're saying, has nothing to do with the actual reality of the statistics. It's simply not true. So we have to start detaching halacha from that fact and stop trying to pretend that our halacha can prevent that. Our halacha remains a divinely ordered system from God. That doesn't mean, however, that everything is flawless in the sense that it presents these problems. Yeah, I think that was well said. I I, I think that um, the key to abuse is understanding that one person really feels 
more powerful than the other. The person being abused is lesser. And I think that it's based on a fundamental assumption of inequality that then has to be corrected. You don't abuse somebody who is your equal or your superior with the same kind of intention or purpose. So I do think that the decoupling of the um, Jewish laws from abuse and its consequences is very important. I think abuse is a problem that is pervasive in our society. That was the point of our paper. It wasn't to indict Judaism or Jewish law. It was simply to point out that this is a problem in the community. And frankly, our, our paper showed that it's a bigger problem in the Haredi community than in the modern Orthodox community, that there's something about being in the more embedded in the real world might give people more of a sense of autonomy. Those were our findings. So that's something that people have to think about how we're going to solve this problem. Dr. Yehuda, the more they're coupled together and the more people believe that halacha is a corrective, the more they're going to take studies like yours and ignore them or pretend that they're false or find flaw with them. Once we can decouple it and say, the halacha says one thing, the halacha is not about abuse. And or, abuse protection is, or, pro- abuse. or protection from abuse. And abuse and its various offshoots is something completely different. The defensiveness can stop because to deny abuse will happen when you believe that it is something which halacha is supposed to prevent. When you say, no, no, halacha is one thing, and abuse and prevention of abuse is a different story altogether, then the defensiveness can end because people won't have to put them together. Yes, and I think that um, you also have to make sure that you give any abuse victim, male or female, a voice. I think why this article came now, it's not a coincidence, there's just been a lot of a discussion in recent weeks with the Ford and Kavanaugh story. You know, I think it, it really activated people about how even being brave enough to tell your story will not necessarily have the desired outcome. No, it you might re-expose and re-trigger you. Yeah, it, right. It might so, not even so be been people, worth it. It's it might not even be worth it, and I think that that is really what we want to prevent. So any message that says, if you would have only followed the laws, this wouldn't have happened to you. I mean, that isn't exactly what what Rabbi Sheffer says, but it's a way that it can be understood that it's within your power to prevent abuse. That isn't such a great message to circulate. And then the other message is that if women see that rabbis are trying to negate statistics, that are there, published in authoritative journals. That is really a perpetuation of this idea that even if you do tell, even if you do disclose, it's not going to get you very far. So I think that the message really has to be not a rabbi telling Jewish women how to behave, but a rabbi saying, Let me hear what you have to say. Let me listen to this problem. And then really being willing to, I like replace the social order. I think that that's a great concept. Um, A lot of things you said, uh, Rabbi Scott, are great, but we need to be able to act on them. And if people are, what you said, being a naval birshut ha-Torah, another great phrase, if they are using the laws to somehow perpetuate abuse, or perpetuate bad behavior rather than eradicate bad behavior, then we have to take a look at how to make structures more safe. I think that I would have really liked to have seen a better rebuttal by Rabbi Shafrin, a rebuttal that says something like, I stand corrected, which was not the case, or maybe we need to really listen as Jewish women tell us what their experience is or how they experience Um, some of these things that we tell them to do. Tali, I don't know if you remember, we both went to the same school in Cleveland, Ohio, called Yavna High School, um, which was effectively a base Yaakov environment. Uh, But we had a teacher, I I had a teacher, who um, insisted that girls not only wear their uniforms um, and sit modestly, but bring in a sweater or a jacket so that they could cover their knees during the class. And of course, we used to sit, be seated alphabetically, 
So as a Yehuda, I was in the last row, last seat in a corner. And also, I didn't always do what I was told. So I didn't wear the sweater. And I was called into the principal's office. And she said to me, you know, Rachel, (laughs) it's such a simple thing. Why can't you just do it? And I said to the principal, you should be a lot more concerned about what the request means rather than my compliance. The point is that we have to really think sometimes about what we're really saying when we talk about modesty. I mean, when that teacher was talking to a group of 15, 14-year-old girls and telling them that he can't handle sitting in front of the classroom unless they're double covered. That isn't such a great message to circulate. That's a pretty insightful thing to say at such a young high school age. Anyway, I would really like to thank you for joining our podcast. And uh, maybe thank you we'll... for the work you guys are doing. And thank you all for listening. Please subscribe to Intimate Judaism wherever you get your podcasts. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and many, many others. Please also remember to sign up for our email list. Just go to IntimateJudaism.com. We're also adding more and more information to that website. There'll be more things appearing there all the time, so please check it out at IntimateJudaism.com and write to us, again, IntimateJudaism at JewishCoffeeHouse.com. We really value your feedback. Thanks for listening. 